Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, uh, well, without further ado, Alan Sly from Berkeley will tell us about mixing in time and space. Okay. Um, thanks, Yuval. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back here again. Uh, so I'm going to tell you, so uh, I was here a bit over a year ago and told you some results about mixing on... Um, uh, for the Glauber dynamics uh, on Erdős Renyi random graphs, um, for some results that weren't sharp, and now I'll tell you uh, a bit about some new results that are, and then uh, at the end I'll tell you a bit about some of the other work I, I've been working on. Uh, so first of all, it will be the Glauber dynamics on random graphs, and uh, I'll also talk about general graphs, um, and mainly for the easing model. OK, so I'll run through some definitions which probably everyone here knows by heart. Um, so uh, mainly be talking about the easing model, uh, be a model of magnetic systems. So it's a probability distribution over configurations. So um, uh, assignments of pluses and minuses to each of the vertices. Um, and it's weighted so that configurations with more pluses next to pluses and minuses next to minuses get more weight. Um, beta, the inverse temperature, will um, regulate the strength of the interactions uh, and so be interested in how um, <coughs> the behavior changes for different values of beta. Okay. Um, and I'll be talking about I guess, two kinds of mixing for these graphs, uh, for, sorry, for the easing model. Um, spatial mixing uh, and temporal mixing. By spatial mixing, I essentially mean that if you take uh, two sets of vertices that are distant, uh, the, the spins, so the pluses and minuses, um, will be essentially independent as the distance between them grows. Uh, and there are several ways you could formalize this notion. Uh, and I'll talk about a couple of them through this talk, but first of all, I'll talk about uniqueness. Um, so this says if you have some, say, finite set of vertices A, um, uh, and is it affected by conditioning vertices at distance R from it, and in particular, does that effect go to zero as R goes to infinity, uh, or is it bounded away from zero? Um, and if it goes to zero, uh, <coughs> then we'll say the uh, model has uniqueness. And, uh, and this will be uh, one notion of spatial mixing, because it will say things that are far away, or uh, conditioning vertices far away, don't really affect um, the, the spins in A. And the other type of mixing I'll talk about will be uh, temporal mixing, by which I mean the mixing time of the Glauber dynamics. So uh, this is a Markov chain which updates vertices uh, one at a time. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, with little explosions. Um, and so, yeah. And so this will be a Markov chain that's reversible with respect to the stationary distribution. And uh, it will be ergodic, so over time it will converge to uh, the stationary distribution. So one, one step, you pick a vertex, forget about what the spin is there, and uh, update it according to the conditional distribution given its neighbors. And this will just depend on how many pluses and how many minuses it's next to. Um, so, 
the main question uh, we'll be looking at is how long does it take to uh, reach the stationary distribution or close to it? And this will be measured in terms of the mixing time. <coughs> so uh, the time it takes uh, for the total variation between the Markov chain and the stationary distribution to be less than some constant uh, from a worst case starting point. Uh, and just by convention, I've got 1 on 2e as the constant. Um, so you can either talk about the discrete version of the chain or the continuous one. Um, it will be convenient for this talk to talk about the continuous version where we update each of the vertices at rate 1 uh, according to Poisson clocks. Um, this will make the mixing time smaller by a factor of n, um, but it'll just uh, otherwise uh, doesn't change the results. And so the, the results will apply for both the discrete and the continuous versions, uh, but the discrete will be the one, the mixing time will be a factor of n larger. Okay. So, Originally, uh, the graphs we're interested in were um, the, the Glauber dynamics were erdos renyi random graphs. Um, and so um, these are graphs, so as I'm sure you also know, like G and P is where you have n vertices and connect um, pairs of vertices with probability P uh, independently. And um, and there's huge amounts known about these graphs. Um, we'll let P grow like D, or I guess decrease like D over N so that you have a constant average degree of D. Um, and so several key properties of these graphs will be important, and these hold with high probability over the graph. So the average degree is D. It's locally tree-like and locally looks like a Galton-Watson branching process uh, with Poisson D offspring distribution. Uh, and the maximum degree grows like uh, log n on log log n. And this is important because um, the uh, essentially most results about mixing times uh, are given in terms of something like if the maximum degree of the graph is less than this, and the um, and beta is less than that, then the mixing time is log n or something. Uh, but here, it grows. Uh, the maximum degree grows with n, so anything of that sort doesn't apply. Um, another property of these graphs that uh, make proving things about the Glauber dynamics more difficult is the fact that. Uh, the size of neighborhoods grows exponentially with the radius, um, uh, at least until uh, for a typical vertex, because locally they look like um, trees and galton watson branching process trees. Whereas a lot of, uh, well, most proofs about the Glauber dynamics um, tend to apply just for, or tend to use the fact that you can take balls that have um, the surface to volume ratio goes to zero as uh, when you take large radiuses. Okay, so last time I was here, uh, I said that uh, I told you about a result where when d tanch of beta is less than one on e squared, then the Glauber dynamics uh, mixes in time or bounded by some polynomial uh, n to the power of a constant uh, for <coughs> almost all erdos renyi random graphs. Uh, but at the time, we, we conjectured that this 1 on e squared term here should actually just be 1. Um, and this was really just an artifact of the proof. Uh, and indeed, that turns out to be the case. So when d tanch of beta is less than 1, then on almost all erdos renyi random graphs, the mixing time is um, n to the theta of 1 on log log n. 
Uh, so th by theta of 1 on log log n, I just mean bounded above and below by const a constant on log log n. Um, where this comes from is essentially that within the graph you have these high degree vertices um, of order log n on log log n. And in fact, with high probability, you'll have a star with um, uh, degree approximately log n on log log n. And you can analyze the mixing time of the Glauber dynamics on them pretty simply uh, to get a lower bound of this form. Um, and it turns out that's essentially the right upper bound as well. This threshold here corresponds to the uniqueness threshold on uh, a Galton-Watson branching process with uh, Poisson offspring distribution. Essentially, the D comes from the fact that uh, this is the um, branching rate of the graph. And uh, so this um, and so this is a result of lines, um, and this <coughs> this turns out to be tight because if you take almost all graphs um, g n d on n, then the mixing time is exponential in n if uh, d tangent beta is greater than one, and this follows from uh, results of uh, Dembo and Montanari, where they calculated the uh, partition function for the easing model on random graphs. And so you can show that there's a bottleneck going between predominantly plus and predominantly minus uh, configurations. The exponentially small amount of the measure is on uh, balanced configurations with equal numbers of pluses or minuses. This regime, is the mixing time also sharp? Yeah, yeah, so... Don't mix faster. No, so there's, uh, it's, well, it, it's... That's why there's a C time. Yeah, so it, it's bounded above and below by n to the constant over log log n. Uh, so okay. for different constants, and though... Mixes and time, so okay. mixing time. Okay, yeah. so, sorry, yeah, <laughs> that, that was... <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, right, so by this I mean the mixing time, uh, in continuous time. Uh, okay, uh, and we can also say something about general graphs of maximum degree d, that when d minus one tanch of beta is less than one, then the Glauber dynamics mixes in theta of log n. Um, and this corresponds to the uniqueness threshold um, on the deregular tree, so because the branching rate's d minus 1 rather than d here. Um, and again, this is sharp in the sense that for almost all random deregular graphs, then the mixing time is exponential in n for uh, when d minus 1 tangent beta is greater than 1. Um, OK. So are there any questions about the results? Or? Um, so I'll tell you how to prove this result and then how to um, modify the proof in order to prove the um, random graph one, because this will be slightly simpler. OK, so um, a, the proof will use uh, monotone coupling. Uh, so, so this is for the, the, yep. for the, kind of the standard, uh, the Gaussian bound would be the D. Yes, the right. Um, yeah. Um, OK, so. Um, yeah, you take the monotone coupling, so you start off with, uh, so you have two copies of the chain starting from the all plus and the all minus configurations. Uh, yeah, I'll do another little graphic. <laughs> um, 
and you couple them so that x plus is always greater than or equal to x minus. And eventually, um, and in this case in a very short period of time, uh, they'll be the same. Um, and so to prove uh, bounds on the mixing time about using couplings, we want to show that uh, they've coupled with probability close to one uh, at time t, and that gives you an upper bound on the mixing time. Uh, and so to do this, uh, we're going to bound the maximum <coughs> over all vertices v of the probability of a disagreement at time t between the two chains and show that this uh, decays exponentially over time. Uh, and the proof uh, heavily relies on uh, kind of new censoring uh, results of uh, Perez and Winkler. Um, so uh, the, um, we construct two new Markov chains, uh, y plus and y minus. Um, and so with a vertex v, which will be arbitrary, a radius r, which will be a constant depending on d and beta, and a time capital T. And the construction goes by saying, uh, and so they'll start off in the all plus and the all minus configurations as usual. Um, and up until time capital T, it'll just be the normal global dynamics. So uh, say that they're equal to x. And then after time capital T, I'm going to censor all updates in this green area outside of a ball of radius r about the vertex v. Um, and then, but inside, I'm going to, we'll continue doing updates as per usual. So, so you don't do the updates outside the ball? No more updates outside of this ball after time capital T. Uh, so these, the spins in these vertices will all be fixed uh, forever. So you just ignore the steps where you choose the vertex? Yeah. So if you, if you decide you were going to do an update in a vert vertex outside of the ball, then you just don't, don't do it. Um, and so the censoring lemma, uh, which applies, like, so, that, so we'll call these chains uh, censored dynamics. And the censoring lemma, which applies to very general ways of censoring, uh, essentially says that we can say that y plus stochastically dominates x plus and x minus stochastically dominates y minus. So in particular, the chance that we have a disagreement at the vertex v uh, in the censored chains is greater than or equal to the chance that we have a disagreement in the uncensored chains. So we use this construction to bound the probability of a disagreement at v um, at some time after time capital T. Um, so are there any questions about the construction? So did you, in the last line, was it supposed to be V? Or, uh, or well, this, so actually it holds for any vertex uh, in the graph, but uh, yeah, so V will be the important one, right? Okay. So what does the dynamics look like? Well, at up at time capital T, any updates outside of the ball uh, stop. So we have this frozen boundary condition uh, that is just the boundary we'd have in the original Glauber dynamics, or actually two boundary conditions, one associated with the plus chain and one associated with the minus chain. Um, but inside the ball, and this will just be a finite graph, it continues going on mixing uh, as, as it always did. Um, and then, so over, in a short period of time, this will become close to its stationary distribution. And so then the question will be, what will be the effect uh, of the different boundary conditions on the vertex V? So in particular, we can bound the chance of the, a disagreement at V by the difference of the boundary conditions under the equilibrium 
measure given the two boundary conditions plus some term that will come from the fact that like, you never get exactly to the stationary distribution. So um, by taking a time s large enough at time capital T plus s, um, the effect of the fact that you're not quite at the stationary distribution can be made small. And also you only need to consider this uh, when there's some disagreement in the ball or the boundary. Uh, yeah, no, no, alpha here is like some constant in terms of like the mixing time of the, uh, the mixing time of, or the worst case mixing time of a ball of maximum degree D of radius R, say. Um, but yeah, essentially we can make this term uh, small. Um, Okay, and so now it's a question of the spatial mixing effect of two different boundary conditions. Um, and so the first assumption I'll make is that, well, I'm going to cheat first of all and say, let's assume that inside the ball, the graph is a tree. Um, and that later on, well, I'll tell, and then I'll tell you how to get around that assumption. Um, say you have two different boundary conditions um, and say they differ at just one vertex. What's the um, effect of the marginal spin at the vertex V? Um, well, it was shown um, in Kenyon, Mosul and Perez that <coughs> it's bounded by tanch of beta to the power of R essentially. Um, regardless, independent of the boundary conditions, because uh, the extreme case is essentially when uh, you have the free boundary condition. Is that the minus sign the thing? Yeah, and uh, one of the eta should be eta prime. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Hmm. Good. No one no one noticed that in the last uh, two times I've used this slide, but <laughs> uh, including me. Yeah. So there should be a minus here and a prime here. So you know by which stage people will completely lost. I have a bound on it at least. <laughs> um, um, and, and hopefully a lower bound here. Uh, <laughs> um, and so what we need, and so changing one, one vertex has an effect of tanch of beta to the R, changing K vertices affects it by at most K times tanch of beta to the R. Uh, so the expected difference uh, in the two boundary conditions uh, is just is bounded by the expected number of disagreements on the boundary uh, times tanch of beta to the r. And so the total number of vertices on the boundary is like d times d minus 1 to the r, or bounded by that. Uh, and the chance of a particular vertex having a disagreement is bounded by the maximum chance of a disagreement. And so now we have this d minus 1 tanch of beta term, which our hypothesis uh, was that this was less than one. And then if we, so by taking R to be large enough, we can make this constant as small as we like, but so, like less than a half or so will be good. Um, and yeah, this is the bound that we want. Um, and okay, so, uh, I haven't said what we do when it's not a tree, but essentially we use uh, Draw White's tree of self-avoiding walks construction. Um, and then looking at the boundary condition on these regular trees is like looking at a boundary condition on his tree of self-avoiding walks. Uh, but I, I won't go into that part, but you get uh, the same bound. Uh, so if you 
put the two bounds together and take a maximum over all the vertices, uh, when S is like, large enough so that the ball inside has mixed well, then the maximum chance of a disagreement has reduced by a half. Um, and so when you take a large time to be large enough constant times log n, then the expected number of disagreements is a little low of one, and uh, you'll have mixed. And you get a uh, lower, yeah, so that's uh, the upper bound, and the, the lower bound is standard uh, by Hayes and Sinclair. Uh, and there are other easy ways of showing that too. Uh, OK, so that's essentially the proof for the graphs of maximum degree D. Are there any questions about that before I move on to random graphs? OK. So now to modify this argument to erdos Rennie random graphs, we need to take uh, larger or balls that are growing with, uh, uh, with n. And so a large constant times log log n will do. Uh, and this is essentially because in a random graph, you can have bits that are denser than uh, usual. And so you need a, a bigger ball in order to establish uh, the kind of spatial mixing result that we need. Um, but in order to then apply the same proof, we need to be able to bound the mixing time inside these balls which are now growing. Um, and, and so this essentially means bounding the mixing time on erdos Rennie random graphs with Poisson offspring distribution. And we do this by uh, bounding the exposure of the graph. And so the exposure is, um, well, it's the minimum over all labelings, V1 through to Vm of, uh, yeah, the cut, yeah, the cut width. The O1 paper, we didn't know the standard terminology. Okay. Okay, so apparently I just got that update now. So this is the cut width of the, <laughs> the graph. Um, so you look at all labelings of <coughs> uh, the vertices or all orderings of the vertices and take the maximum or take the minimum over the maximum of the number of edges between over i from v1 to vi and its complement. Um, and this is and this can be used to bound the mixing time essentially. Well, in this case, it will, will get an exponential in uh, the cut width as the uh, important term. Um, and so we need to bound this on Galton Watson branching processes with Poisson offspring distribution. And this can be just done recursively because. So the claim the GW branching process, which has Poisson D. Uh, uh, Plus on D offspring distribution uh, and M levels. Oh. Yeah, so people had, so not only had the previous audiences. Well, we, we, this was already established. Yeah, and, and also the, the author of the slides too, I think. But, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, so so it, it's Poisson plus a large constant times m the depth. Um, and you can <coughs> do this inductively on the depth. So uh, <coughs> each, uh, so, you, the, so you have a root with Poisson number of children. Each of the children um, have cut width that's uh, stochastic, independently stochastically dominated by a constant times m minus one uh, plus a Poisson, and uh, and if you kind of put them together in the 
or construct uh, a sequence of vertices in the obvious way from these, then and do a bunch of calculations, uh, essentially bounding uh, things about Poisson random variables, then. But do you optimize something in the order, or do you yes. take them left to right? Uh, no, I mean you you order them in uh, increasing or decreasing. Um, yeah, you take the right ordering of them. So, yeah, if you order the subtrees in increasing order, then, uh, yeah, if the constant's large enough, uh, you, you get this bound. Um, and then by taking a maximum over all the vertices, uh, this gives you a, a bound of order log n on log log n. Um, and if you put that back in the bound on the mixing time, that gives you a bound on the mixing time of uh, these local balls. And then if you apply the um, previous proof, uh, then you get the result. Um, OK. So, so these techniques, uh, I guess, also apply <coughs> for the hardcore model on bipartite graphs. So we can't get a, um, we couldn't prove it on completely general graphs, on completely general deregular bipartite graphs. But um, if the girth is large enough, uh, then we can uh, prove bounds on the mixing time. Um, and also for almost all uh, random deregular bipartite graphs uh, up to the uniqueness threshold again. Um, OK, so uh, in the remaining time, I'll tell you a bit about uh, some other work I've been doing or done. So I guess last time I was here, I told you that we'd worked on the coloring version of this mixing time for erdos rennie random graphs. And here we, um, so the previous approach doesn't work because the, um, the coloring isn't a monotone system. Um, so the censoring uh, lemma doesn't apply and doesn't, doesn't really, well, at least in the sense that we used it doesn't quite make sense because uh, there's no ordering, like there's no monotone coupling. Um, Dyer, Flaxman, Fries, and Vigoda showed that um, uh, if the number of colors grows like log log n, then you get polynomial mixing of the Glauber dynamics f uh, for colorings of erdos rennie random graphs. Uh, they conjectured that with um, a constant number of colors, uh, you should still have polynomial mixing, and uh, yeah, we were subsequently able to prove that. Um, so how close is your QV to the actual uh, chromatic number? Um, good question. So uh, the answer is a long way away. Uh, we we were happy just that it was a constant. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about what the uh, conjectured picture is for when you should have fast mixing from the, um, and it comes from the spin glass community of uh, people like Mazard and Parisi and Zakina. And, and their picture is that if you look at the space of colorings where two colorings are adjacent, um, uh, if they just differ at a, single vertex, uh, then um, when the average degree is small, the space of coloring should just be one big connected uh, set. And you might expect the Glauber dynamics or local Markov chains to, to work well. Um, although this seems very hard to prove, uh, our, our results are somewhere back with really low average degrees compared with the number of colors. Um, 
And, but then after some threshold, the space of colorings breaks up into exponentially many um, clusters. And here, Markov chain techniques uh, uh, can't be expected to work because, uh, well, the Glauber dynamics won't be ergodic for a start. And um, yeah, so the. Yeah, and the, the, like the distance between the clusters is like order log n. So, um, in fact, uh, there aren't even really good algorithms to find cluster, uh, to find colorings in this regime. Um, and then after, then you have the coloring threshold after which you have no colorings. Uh, the distance between clusters is Oh, yeah, sorry, linear. Yeah. Um, so the reason why I mentioned this uh, is that this threshold is conjectured to be the reconstruction threshold uh, for colorings on um, uh, trees. So I'll quickly tell you uh, about what that means. So if you, ha you have an infinite tree and the, the right one here will be f the uh, Galton-Watson branching process tree with Poisson offspring distribution, although the actual results would also apply equally to the DRE tree because this will, these will be asymptotic results for large D and the, the fluctuations you get in Poisson for large D are uh, smaller than the uh, other errors in the results. Um, so the, the reconstruction is another sort of spatial mixing, essentially saying that, uh, <coughs> say you look at the colors at level M down from the root, um, do the, does this, how much information does this provide you about the color of the root? So if the, if the mutual information between the colors at level M and the colors at the root is bounded away from zero as m goes to infinity, you say you have reconstruction, otherwise you have non-reconstruction. Um, when, so for, for large q number of colors and d, uh, Mosel and Perez um, showed that uh, essentially q log q number of colors uh, well, the degree greater than q log q uh, is needed for re um, well is sufficient for reconstruction, and this is just by kind of the the simplest algorithm that you could do, where you say, well, if if a, you look at a parent and all the colors appear amongst its children but one, then ob obviously you know that the other color must be the color of the parent, and when you have uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> um, but the the reason why I mentioned that was that even though this is uh, quite a simple algorithm uh, and it's <clears throat> uh, something that can be uh, you can analyze, uh, and essentially this is what the analysis shows. <coughs> it turns out to be um, extremely close to um, like what the true threshold is, and possibly is the, the true reconstruction threshold, and figuring out whether or not it is is uh, <coughs> something I've been thinking about. But definitely up to, actually, I'd, <clears throat> I don't think that's the right reconstruction threshold, and at least the case when you have five colors, uh, it isn't. So probably isn't in general. But the you, you don't think which one? Is oh, the, the top one or the sorry. Oh, no. Well, either actually, but um, <coughs> the the threshold you. So this is the threshold you get for when the, the simple algorithm works. Um, and I don't think that's the, the right threshold. Um, 
but it's very close because uh, essentially the difference in the bounds is in the third order term and just replacing a 1 with a 1 minus log 2. Uh, so, yeah, it's fairly close to the truth. Um, so how do you prove this? How do you prove this? Um, So essentially, you want to look at generate inequalities for the expected value of the posterior distributions given the roots and create recursions for that using, the, using all the uh, conditional independence that you have here. And something that hmm. if you do the calculations in the right way you see that when when you're just a bit below this threshold the information you have uh, just starts to really reduce quite rapidly because once um, once there are a few colors that you don't um, know very well, then uh, the picture that you have... <clears throat> so once you're a bit uncertain about what a color is, then the uncertainty just builds and builds and builds. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's... Yeah, so when, when you're around this value, um, if I, if I say, uh, just um, didn't tell you the values of a, f a very small proportion of the colors, uh, you'd, um, you wouldn't be able to reconstruct it. Um, so this is partly because uh, you're a very long way from the what's called the keston stegen bound, um, which well, I'll mention in the next slide, which is say if you if you think of this as a Markov chain going down each of the um, branches of the tree, then uh, and lambda is the second eigenvalue of the transition matrix, then the keston stegen bound says that you have reconstruction when d lambda squared is greater than 1. Now for colorings, uh, uh, this would say that you have reconstruction when the degree is about q minus 1 squared, um, but actually uh, you have reconstruction when it's about q log q. So you're uh, a long way away from the keston stegen bound, but when you're once you start introducing a bit of noise um, and you can't do this kind of recursive, simple, uh, sorry for keep calling it simple, but uh, <laughs> um, but if, if you keep using the, um, <clears throat> this reconstruction algorithm, introducing a little bit of noise uh, uh, means that uh, the information will uh, <coughs> start decaying really quickly. Um, uh, I've already talked, I talked about these results when I was here in summer, so um, I guess I'll just say that they confirmed uh, uh, large parts of conjectures by Mazard and Montanari from uh, work on spin glasses using numerical simulations uh, and essentially that the keston stegen bound is tight when q equals 3 and the degree is large and um, not tight when q is greater than or equal to 5. And can also say what the asymptotics are for, for large degrees. Okay. Um, so one of the themes of this talk was essentially that 
understanding what happens on trees, tell, or Gibbs measures on trees tells you about Gibbs measures on general graphs. And so I thought I'd tell you an example which uh, says the opposite. Um, essentially that you have, that there exists a Gibbs measure which is basically an antiferromagnetic POTS model with an extra special state where you have uniqueness on the deregular tree but not on a specially constructed deregular graph. Um, and so this is essentially cliques joined together in the right way. Um, and this uh, was a counterexample uh, uh, to a conjecture that Elkanan made that the regular tree should always be the extreme case uh, for spatial mixing. Um, and yeah, turns out not to always be true. So probably shouldn't talk too much about counterexamples to my advisor's conjectures. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have any. He, he started off by disproving <laughs> 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 one, one question is still open for uh, monotone? Yes. Monotone. Um, monotone, uh, yeah. Like the, like the easy model. So for the easy model, it's, it's, no, it's no. Yeah. It's yeah. The general monotone system. Uh, and it's also still open for uh, if you replace uniqueness with strong spatial mixing. And the kind of, the kind of examples here, uh, like this one, wouldn't apply in that case. Um, okay, uh, I've also done like work on like reconstruction from another point of view. So here's a problem, so this was with Guy Bressler and Elkanan, and you have, so this time I'll tell you uh, the values of a Markov random field, but not the underlying graph. And so um, you want to reconstruct what the graph is. Now if I just give you one example of it, it's, it's just like basically zeros and ones, so you wouldn't be able to say anything. Um, but if I give you independent copies of the drawn from the stationary distribution, how many do you need and how can you reconstruct the underlying graph? Um, and just using simple combinatorial properties about uh, mark of random fields under for bounded degree and with some mild non-degeneracy conditions, uh, we showed that essentially log n samples is enough and that you could do this with uh, a rigorous bound, polynomial bound on the running time in terms of the number of vertices. Um, uh, I'm generally interested in mixing time problems. So another, uh, <coughs> yeah, so another, <coughs> so the Glauber dynamics is used in Lots of, uh, <clears throat> can be used generally to sample from complicated high dimensional distributions. And uh, it turns out in practice it actually is used uh, by people. And so sociologists uh, look at what are called exponential random graphs. And these are <coughs> models for social networks. Um, and the idea is to incorporate more triangles than you'd otherwise have uh, in the graph. So this is basically, if you have a couple of friends, they're a lot more likely to be friends than just two random people in the population. Um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> and they actually use this model and actually use the Glauber dynamics to sample from it. Um, and so this is... A sample one. So it's a distribution on graphs, and they want to be able to sample from the graphs in order to first of all, see what they look like, and also um, calculate things and be able to do uh, statistical inference on it. Um, but we showed that uh, in the asymptotics, when as the number of uh, vertices grows, 
um, we could work out when you have fast and slow mixing, and either what you have is that you have fast mixing, uh, in which case you have uh, in the limit, these graphs are essentially erdos renyi random graphs, and so you have no more triangles than you'd otherwise expect. So the, or the Glauber dynamics takes exponentially long to mix. So in either case, there are real problems with it. Um, Yeah, so, so one step of the Glauber dynamics is essentially to choose a pair of vertices, uh, work out the conditional probability that an edge should be in the graph, and either choose to place or not place an edge there according to that probability. Um, yeah, and so we can, uh, so we have like explicit, um, we can explicitly say when it's fast mixing and slow mixing. Um, so would it make any difference if you just use the Metropolis algorithm or something slightly different? Uh, no, because there's a, um, exponential bottlenecks uh, that cause the slow mixing. Uh, so, so this shows that the results of the sociologists are invalid? Um, <laughs> so yes. it would... Uh, not give me a lot of faith in, in them. Uh, I mean, maybe for, for certain values of parameters and small values of n, they say something, but generally, so generally what happens with this is, it's what's the most efficient way of, uh, so the, pr the probability, it's just uh, like, you put the number of triangles into the Hamiltonian, and so you, you weight graphs that have more triangles more heavily, um, properly normalized. And so what's the most efficient way to add more triangles? It's not by coming up with a, an intricate graph that has lots of triangles, it's by adding more edges and still keeping them really random. So you get, so basically what you get is an erdish many random graph with a higher average degree. Um, maybe, Maybe when n is small, you get um, some more structure, but um, yeah, so. Why uh, are the sorry? Why are the okay, so, uh, so if you started off with Erdős Reni random graphs, um, hmm. so essentially we come up with a function, so this will be p between 0 and 1, and um, <coughs> if you have a fixed point of this equation, what it means is that uh, if you start off with an erdős Reni random graph g and p, and update an edge, then the probability that you place an edge will be p. And so, essentially, so when there are multiple solutions to this, it's the slow mixing case, and it means that if you start off with an erdős Reni random graph at P1, or say P2 here, then it would stay very close uh, in distribu or distribution to either of these values. Um, so, so you can, generally have either very sparse graphs or very dense graphs, uh, depending on what this function looks like, as kind of metastable states for the distribution. So there are just these two? Uh, I mean, in general, uh, so in general we can't say a lot about what happens in this slow mixing state, although... Because um, if it was really just like this, it wouldn't be so much of a problem. Like I don't know whether interested in that. Yeah, no, and that's probably what it's like. Um, although still, uh, but we can't, we can't prove that it looks like that and that you don't have more inhomogeneous graphs that are really where most of the mass of the distribution lies. But if you, if you did believe that it was like that, then you may as well just take an Erdős-Reni random graph with these probabilities. 
because uh, they'll be they'll be very similar to these in the sense that if you count the number of any small type of subgraph, they'll be uh, close to what you'd expect in an erdos Rani random graph. Um, yeah. Yeah. represents some dynamics by which you know, those second order you know, frames might get to yeah. count first order. Yeah. And so are there security reasons why you can't make the print any bigger in this <laughs> <laughs> No, just space reasons. So um, yeah, so I've seen like a talks on this where they say, oh well we take the uh, graph of the 9-11 terrorist plotters, so like, the colors here indicate which plane they were on, and, uh, and then say, well, this is what we knew before the um, attacks. Can we infer extra edges uh, in the graph? Um, and so they say that works well, um, but, and maybe because, maybe it works well because the graphs aren't actually distributed uh, according to the um, exponential random graph distribution. So, um, yeah, so these just say which flight they were on. And so I think that really high degree vertex one was the, the lead guy. Um, uh, and finally, uh, yeah, I also work on, I'm with EAL on cutoff problems. Uh, so um, I'm sure you've heard what the cutoff is, just a, like an abrupt convergence uh, of, um, to the stationary distribution in some narrow window. And uh, over the summer, we um, proved cut off for simple random walk and non-backtracking random walk on random, almost all random deregular graphs. Um, and also for the easing model when you have strong spatial mixing on the uh, torus. Uh, and I've also done work on continuous probability, but I think it's, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>
And this is a special case, which might be easier. Um, yeah. Yeah, don't know. Sorry. <laughs>